blessed every time we get together with you all for worship. It's my joy to be with you here again, and, and uh, thank you for being here. Uh, word may have leaked out that I was coming, I, and I thank you for coming anyway. So uh, it's great. Thank you for, for the joy. Uh, I know you've been blessed. Uh, somebody was just sharing how uh, they've been so blessed by all the different uh, preachers who've come to share God's word, and, and uh, they put a little pressure on me saying, well, you better step up because it's been good, so don't mess it up, and I'll, I'll do my best to do that. But I, I did want to give you a report at Park Ridge. Uh, we just came out of our week of vacation Bible school, and uh, it is glorious. It's quite an event. I, I stepped back on the edge and was just reflecting of how great and I, uh, how well they do vacation Bible school there at Park Ridge. And, um, we had uh, over 600 registered, and then uh, I don't know if all that if all that crowd showed up or not, but it was a great crowd. Many children came to know Christ, and uh, so many workers. It was just a glorious, glorious time, so thank you for your prayers. I also want to thank you for your prayers for our mission trip to France. We got back on the 7th of July from France, and uh, we were there when the riots were happening, but we did not cause them, I promise. We did not cause them. We could see the smoke in our city of Marseille, but we had a had a great opportunity of distributing God's word to people uh, there and uh, reaching out to uh, many people from North Africa. And uh, thank you for the, uh, your prayers for being a part of that. Now, this week at Park Ridge, we're, we're uh, opening our church building to, be, to house a couple of families with Hope South Florida. It's a ministry nearby. Uh, they minister to homeless people. So there's some people who are waiting to get in permanent shelter, and that's an exciting time of ministry of just providing meals. And then at the end of this week, we'll be in Boston for a family mission trip. So a lot of exciting things happening at Park, Park Ridge. We appreciate your prayers and for that. Now today we're going to be looking at James chapter 4, verses 1 through 6. And uh, as you know, James has a idea that it's like a a little bit like a Proverbs of the New Testament because there are many topics covered, many different ideas that James brings to the table and uh, points them together. It's not like a long flowing theme, but a bunch of bullet points that James likes to bring us and it's so practical. I think that's why we love the book of James. That's why we love to hear what he has to say for us. And so today is very practical again. So today we're going to hear about wisdom during times of conflict. We're going to also hear about a challenge for prayer and a warning for pride. So today as we listen to, to God's word, we want to be uh, thinking about how would he lead us to respond to his word and for how uh, good he is. Now, as we uh, think about this, this idea that I've used, picking the wrong fight, I don't know if you've ever seen a movie or read a story where uh, the wrong character was picked on and drawn into a fight, and it ended up being the person that was the strongest or the, the one that you definitely did not want to mess with. I think about those scenes often and how some proud guy comes and picks on the wrong person, and then they regret it. Well, today we're going to be talking about fights that you and I would regret if we get involved in. And so we don't want to pick the wrong fight as well as we look at God's Word. So let's read together James 4, 1 through 6, and I'll read it out for us from the ESV. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. You adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it is for no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he's made to dwell in us. But he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Let's pray again as we enter God's word. Father, we thank you for this word and for the practical nature of the book of James. And now we pray that 
Uh, Father, you give us tender hearts to hear your voice. God, I pray that my voice would fade away and that what we would hear today would be you and that, God, your Holy Spirit would communicate to us today and help us to know how to live, how to bring honor and glory to you, how to bring peace and power into the circumstances that we find in life. And so, Lord, we ask that you'd be glorified as we hear and respond in obedience to your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, picking the wrong fights. First of all, the, the fights that I want to talk about, as you see James talks about, is fights in the church. The first three verses there, he mentions this idea that there are fights among you, and we know he's addressing Christians that are dispersed. So he says, what causes quarrels? What causes fights among you? It sounds like between fellow Christians. Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and you do not have, so you murder. You covet and you cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. You do not have because you do not ask. Let's stop there and look at it. So it brings up the fact that our fights and our quarrels are because of our passions. That word is used in several different places in the New Testament, this idea of passions or desires. In Luke 8, 14, Jesus usually said the seed, talking about the seeds that were spread, he says the seed fell among thorns stands for those who hear, it stands for those who hear, but as they go on their way, they are choked by life's worries, riches, and pleasures. That word pleasures or passions or desire. So pleasures and passions can choke out God's word in our lives and that people do not mature. In Titus 3.3 3 it says, For we ourselves were once foolish, disobedient, led astray, slaves to various passions. That's that word again, passions and pleasures. Passing our days away in malice and envy, hated by others and hating others as well. And then 2 Peter 2.13 says that we suffer wrong as the wages of their wrongdoing. These evil people, they count it pleasure to revel in the daytime. So this idea of pleasure, desires, reveling is this idea of what we have that causes fights. It says these passions are at war in you. Have you ever felt like there was a war going on inside you? I try to be peaceable myself. I try to... To, to get along, but sometimes there's something going on inside of me. And I, I don't know about you, Clay, but sometimes I have an argument inside my head, sometimes with myself. And so I disagree with myself a lot of times, but I feel like there's a war going on in me, and that's what James points out. And perhaps this explains my struggles and your struggles with living the godly life. Because there is a war going on in our lives, and there's a a challenge between the new creature that God can make us through Jesus Christ, that once we are in Christ, the Bible says we're a new creature. That's great news. The bad news is we still have an old nature. And so those old habits, those old patterns that we've formed in our flesh, that new creature has to work through those and slowly push those things out. Like in uh, Colossians, Paul says it's like taking off old clothes and putting on new clothes, this idea of our new identity in Christ. But there is a war going on, and this battle rages in us, and it can spread through us. That's why James is addressing these fights that are among them. He says it's because of these passions at war. I thought it was interesting to look at this pattern he sets up. He says, you have this attitude, then it leads to a frustration, and then it leads to an action. He says, first of all, your attitude is a desire, but your frustration is because you don't have. And so you commit murder. Now, Jesus said, if you look at somebody and have hate in your heart, you've committed murder. So that can be us. Now, most of us would say, we haven't committed murder, but perhaps within our hearts, we've done that. Then the other, another chance it says, you covet, and you cannot obtain, so you fight and you quarrel. So there seems to be this pattern of action when we are, want something, and yet when we are frustrated that we can't get what we want, and so it causes us to act in an ungodly way. The, he uses the word covet in verse 2. He says, you desire, you cannot have, so you murder. You covet, and you cannot obtain. That word covet is forbidden in the Tenth Commandment. Don't to covet your neighbor's animals, your neighbor's wife, 
We're not to want what is not ours in a way that causes us to do negative things and to want something in a way that really makes us feel like we are missing something. Have you ever noticed that, that uh, there's an attitude change between, even though I still don't have something that somebody else has, but when I'm grateful for what I do have. There is an attitude change. But coveting says, I want what I want, and I won't be happy until I get what I want. And that leads us to sin. And that leads us to quarrels and fights, as James says. So these desires are the sources of fights among believers. Now, I'm giving you an idea of how that quarrels can be solved. I'm so thankful that this group that I've found is nothing but peaceable, amicable, working together, doing great. But when changes come, when tensions rise, when my desires don't get met, style, structure, strategies can change. We might be tempted to say, but I want what I want. I want what I want. And so when we have that desire, we have to respond in a different way than them. The worldly response says, I murder, I fight, I quarrel. But that's not God's way. And I want to challenge you when it comes to church fights. I don't know if you've ever been a part of one. Uh, I've been a part of a few that have been the worst times of my life, literally. And uh, I want to challenge you, friends, as I challenge myself. Let's not mess with the bride of Christ. Whenever you cause fights within a church fellowship, you are messing with the bride of Christ. That's a fight you don't want to be in. That's picking the wrong fight. Don't mess with the bride of Christ, his church. Woe to the person who causes divisions and fights in the church. Don't, be, don't have that set of you. God has placed this church in this place for a reason, and you and I do not have the privilege to cause up division or stir up fights. And James is saying that's what happened in this place. These Christians must have had the same thing. He said, I know why you're fighting. It's because of your desires. It's because they're warring in you. And it doesn't have to be that way. He gives the solution. The solution is asking rightly. Did you see that in verse 3? He says, you do not have, well, the, the last part of verse 2, he says, you do not have because you do not ask. And you ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. There's those passions again causing trouble. So James says the pattern should change from desire. That's the same as, as was mentioned before where there was quarrels. The result of frustration was there the same. You don't have. But now he says the response should be prayer. Prayer. So the answer to these conflicts and to not getting into the conflicts is to pray correctly. Prayer is the right action. I hope it doesn't sound too cliche or too trite to say prayer is the answer to our conflicts, but it is. It is the answer. Now, some of the problem is our wrong prayers. James says you don't, you don't have because you don't ask. That's, that's the wrong prayer never said. Then he says in verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you've asked in the wrong way. Now, if you were praying in the wrong way, would you want someone to tell you? Would you? Good, because that's where I'm going. Okay, uh, so I just want to check, make sure. But evidently, the people there had been praying, maybe praying wrongly, maybe praying with their covet prayer list, their desires, their worldly passion prayer list. And James says, you've been praying the wrong way. You haven't even been asking for the right things, first of all, and you've been going in the wrong way, and it's causing fights in the church. So first of all, the first problem is not asking your good father at all. The only thing worse than praying for the wrong thing is not praying at all. So I want to challenge you to think about praying and praying about everything. At one time I was helping a, a man who'd gotten saved in our church. He'd only been a Christian a few years and he says, I don't pray for myself. And I was like, why don't you pray for myself? He's like, I don't want to bother God with my personal needs. I'm like, well, God wants to move and work in your personal needs. You can pray about anything. There's nothing you can't pray about, and God wants you and invites you to do that. Let me read from Matthew 7, where Jesus gives us some great encouragement about prayer. Matthew 7, verse 7 through 11. Jesus said this in the great Sermon on the Mount. He said, Ask, and it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. 
For everyone who asks, receives. And the one who seeks, finds. And to the one who knocks, it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then, who are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? Jesus said, God is waiting for you, asking for you to ask him, to call out to him and to prayer. The, the exclamation there that I underlined is, how much more? How much more does your Heavenly Father want to give you than even what we ask? He's going to give us the good things that we ask for. So I want to challenge you that there's nothing we can't pray about. We can pray about everything. And the, one of the causes for conflicts in the church is that we don't ask at all or that we ask for the wrong motives. So look at this. So here's what right prayers are. Not those wrong motives about... Give me mine, I want mine, I want my way, I want what makes me comfortable. Those are things that cause conflicts, right? Those are what prayers that are going the wrong way. God, help me get what I want. Well, I'm so thankful God hasn't answered some of my prayers like that. I've prayed some wrong prayers in the past thinking, God, if you knew what I knew, you would give me this. And I'm so thankful that God in his sovereignty and his grace said, no, son. No, just like I told my children a long time ago, no, there's things you can't do because I love you. There's things you shouldn't do because I want to protect you and I want to provide for you. And so I've told my children no, and so my Heavenly Father sometimes tells me no, and I'm so thankful that He does that. So here's the answer to right prayers. We need to have the right motives when we pray. And uh, we need to be thinking about God's glory and His kingdom, not our wants and our desires and our passions. Okay, so there's two things, two, two uh, points that I often point out when we talk about prayers that, that we want to see praying the right way, praying rightly. James says you're praying the wrong way. You're praying selfishly. He says here's some ways to pray correctly. Is the first of all is to pray according to his will. Pray according to God's will. 1 John 5, 14 says this, and this is the confidence that we have towards him that if we ask Anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 John 5, 14, and this is the confidence that we have towards him that if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. What a great promise. Sometimes I think we don't take these promises of Jesus seriously enough. We pray as if, pray as if I know he said that, but I, I don't think he really wants to meet our needs. No, he does want to meet our needs as we pray according to his will. So the question is, what do you want, Lord? Not what do I want. What do you want, Lord? What is your will? That's the way Jesus prayed, isn't it? Remember in the garden when he was facing the cross, about to suffer the, the, a cruel and painful trial, and then dying on the cross, he said, God, not your will, but mine. He wanted God's will first and that's the way you and I should pray and that's the way it's been promised that we can have confidence when we pray when we pray God's will well how do you know God's will you, re, you know his word you can pray his word and that gives you direction and you can know what he leads you and guides you to do and, and match it up according to God's word and then you can say I have confidence God wants to meet this need in my life because it's according to his will it's for his glory it's for his kingdom's sake and the second uh, factor that I think we often need to think about, about praying rightly, is praying in his name. John 14, 13 says, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. John 14, 13, Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So, now, some people think, in Jesus' name is just the way you come to a conclusion of your prayer. You know, that's just included. In Jesus' name, amen. That's like one block that you put at the end. Well, it's important to be in there, and there's a reason why Christians include that in their prayers is because this promise. He says, whatever you ask in my name, I will do it, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. So that's an important qualifying phrase there, isn't it? You can't just ask for anything in his name. 
It's got to be something that glorifies God. So when we pray in His name, we're saying we pray because of who you are, Jesus. Because of who Jesus is, we're praying this. Because of what Jesus has done and accomplished, we're praying this. So when we pray according in His name, we're asking God to do these things so that He can bring glory to Himself. This is the kind of prayer Jesus would want me to pray. So I'm praying it in His name because of what He's done, because of who He is, because of all that He's accomplished in the cross. I'm praying this in His name. Father, would you hear me? Now, there's some things you can't pray in Jesus' name. Would you agree with me about that? Lord, help me rob this bank in Jesus' name. No, I can't do that. I can't pray that prayer. It's sinful. It's wrong. It's not going to bring glory to Jesus. What about help me get even with this person? No, he's not going to answer that in Jesus' name. There's no way Jesus is going to get glory from you getting even with somebody. God, help me to get my way. Maybe not. Unless we're praying according to his will and in his name for his glory, God's not going to answer our prayers. And I want to be a person that responds to these promises, these glorious promises, and sees God work in our prayers. Let's pray that God would do this. Now, James uses a strong word to talk about somebody who's living according to their passions, not by prayer. He uses the word adulterer. Adulterers. Let's go on to the next, next point. Then look at verses 4 through 5. Not only fighting within the church, but fighting with God. Look, in, look at verses 4 and 5. He says, you adulterous people. James is kind of soft and fuzzy, isn't he? He's just kind of like being kind, isn't he? You adulterous people. Do you not know that your friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that is to no purpose that the Scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Wow. Just think about that pattern above, that we can actually be fighting with God. So we've got fights with the church because we're warring with our passions in our own life, saying, I want what I want. I'm coveting. Power, influence, direction, comfort, any of those things that we covet, that's causing fights in the church. And now it can cause fights with God himself. We can be enemies of God. That's pretty strong. So that pattern above, the desire but don't have leads to murder, that's the world's way. James says it's being friends with the world. And uh, that's a, a sad state to be in. And whenever you see the... The term the world used in the Bible, it's often terms, it's not talking about the globe, it's not talking about the physical earth as a planet, it's talking about the system of life outside of God's control. That's the world. That's where we used to live until we met Christ. If you haven't met Christ, you're still living in the world. But if you know Christ, we've come out of the world and into his kingdom. We're part of the family of God. So look what James says in verse 4 and 5. He says, Friendship with the world is adulterous. That word philia, friendship, is used uniquely here. It's the only time that it uses that, that word here and talking about friendship of the world. We're influenced by our friends, aren't we? We, we tell our kids that, that you, are, you become your friends. We tell them that, that you know, who, the company you share influences who you are. Well, friends, if we're friends of the world, we're going to be influenced by that. And then the bad news, the terrible result of befriending the world is that we become an enemy of God. That's a bad day. That's a bad life to be an enemy of, the, of God. The God of this universe against me because I've chosen to be friends with the world. James warns us that this is dangerous. You know, here in Florida, we have some split loyalty sometimes. I don't know if it's in your life, Greg, or not, but there's split loyalty. Sometimes there are couples that are actually Seminole fans and Gator fans in the same house. I don't understand it. I don't understand how you could be for either of those teams being from Alabama. But anyway, there are, how, there are houses divided. Perhaps you've seen those car tags that have two things. Split loyalty within that house. When it comes to God, though, there is no split loyalty. 
when it comes to our relationship with Him, we cannot say we, we're keeping our options open. We're playing a little bit here, a little bit there. We're being a friend of the world, and then we'll come to church on Sunday. No, we cannot do that. We can't. We can't say we love God and love the world at the same time. You and I can't be half-hearted about it. You and I can't be half-hearted, divided among our loyalties. God has a, he doesn't like it either. He is actually gets jealous about it. He says, or do you suppose that it's by no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell in us? Wow, the jealousy of God. We read that passage earlier from Exodus 34 that talked about all these great descriptions of who God is, how he walks among us, but that he is a jealous God. It said that very clearly in, in Exodus 13. So he's jealous over the spirit that he puts in us. Now, I didn't realize until I got way into my study that this is one of the more challenging verses to interpret because in Greek, all the letters are capital. So when he says the spirit, you're like, is that the Holy Spirit? Or is that the spirit of man, like when he breathed into man at creation? But it seems to make sense that it's talking about the Holy Spirit that he dwells in us through salvation, that he's parted in us and lives in us, and that that is what is jealous about our divided flesh. And Galatians 5, 17 says, the desires of the flesh are against the spirit. And the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For those who those for these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the wrong things you want to do. Wow, that's pretty parallel to this thing. James is saying, "Don't be a friend of the world because it's going to make you an enemy of God." And God jealously yearns for to be first place, to be your only love, not a split, not a half-hearted love. So, in First Corinthians six nineteen, the Bible tells us that. The Holy Spirit comes to dwell within us. We're a temple of the Holy Spirit. What a beautiful sight. In the Old Testament, God had a, a temple for His Spirit and for His people. And now He has a people for His temple. He's dwelling in those of us that know Christ. And so with jealousy, that Spirit in us says, don't have a divided heart. Don't be a friend of the world. Be wholehearted for Jesus. I love that phrase. It's interesting that He says, or do you suppose that it's for no purpose? That word means empty. Is it for an empty reason that he's put his spirit in us? No. Friends, there is a purpose for the spirit in each believer. It's so that we can know God personally. We can hear his voice. We can be guided by him. We can experience the power of his life in our life. We are folded into him. We have become children of God. So there is a purpose for the spirit being in us. But we do have a jealous God. That word is frequently ascribed to God, and God even uses it in describing himself. That's a challenge. It's a challenge for us. Let me just read a few of those that are looking at it. First, in Exodus 20, in the Ten Commandments, it's used of, uh, God describes himself to Moses. He says in, uh, well, in 2 verses 1 through 5, talking about the different images. He says, and God spoke these words, saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I am the Lord your God. He says, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation. Right from the beginning, God says, here's my Ten Commandments, and by the way, don't have any other images because I'm a jealous God. This is why we should do that. So that's why in Christianity, we have no images, no icons. We celebrate the cross. We focus on who Jesus is, but we don't have a, a God that we're setting up here worshiping. Like if you go to some of these uh, temples in different places. No, we don't do that. We worship the living God who is alive. And then in that passage we read um, in Exodus 34, it's interesting that God says, I'm going to make a covenant with this people. 
Exodus 34, verses 10. I'm making a covenant before all the people, and I'm going to do marvels such as never been seen or created in all the earth, in any nation. And then he says down in verse 14, uh, he said, you're going to be moving into these other people. I'm going to give you victory over them, and you're going to break down their false altars. You're going to break down their Asherah poles, their Asherim. Verse 14, and you shall worship no other God, for the Lord, whose name is Jealous, is a jealous God. How does that make you feel? A jealous God. God is always portrayed in the Bible. His jealousy moves him to take action. Whenever it talks about his jealousy, by his jealousy, it moves him to action to defend his name or to do a great thing. Now, we know what it can't be. The negative reaction that we often think about jealousy, we often have a negative feel. Uh, we, we struggle because we use human language to describe holy God. He's not like us, but we use our language that we often talk about God having in the hands of God. Well, God doesn't have hands. He's spirit. Jesus had hands that were nailed to the cross, but God doesn't. We often talk in Psalm 91 about being under his wings. Well, God doesn't have wings. We're just using that because it's a picture. Our language falls short. And so when we say God is a jealous God, sometimes we think about the negative things. J.I. Packer wrote a book called Knowing God. He has a chapter about the jealous God. And uh, we have two understandings of, of jealousy. One is a vicious understanding. Uh, I want what you have, so I'm jealous of you. That's a negative understanding of jealousy. And that would be describing God. He wouldn't be that way. There is a righteous way of thinking of jealousy. That's to protect or to avenge a love relationship. Proper love comes with a zeal to protect that relationship. So out of God's covenant love, he says, I'm a jealous God. Where there is no love, there's no jealousy. If somebody were to be getting too friendly with my wife, I'd be protecting that covenant relationship that I have with her because I love her. It's not because I, my character is bad. It's because my character is good that I would be jealous about that. And I would say, I want you to love me only, and I want to love you only. Our Heavenly Father says the same thing. I'm making a covenant with you. I'm going to be your God. And you're going to be my people. And if you get friendly with the world, I'm going to be jealous. And that spirit that I've put within you is going to tell you when I'm getting jealous, and you're going to know that you've crossed the line. You've gone too far. You've become too friendly with the world, and now my spirit is jealous that's in you. Wow. So, a jealous God, enmity with God. We're fighting fights with our own God if we choose to be a friend of the world. We don't want to do that. And then finally, this last verse, verse 6, talks about a fight you will lose. This is kind of negative, isn't it? But I'm trying to follow what James is saying. Verse 6, he says, but he gives more grace. Therefore, it says, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. There it is again. God opposes the proud. You will lose a fight if you want to be act like you're proud. You're going to lose that fight. Let me just say that. If you think you're able to live your life in a well, way that's pleasing, meets all your needs, does everything right, perfect every time, you're going to lose that fight. You're going to lose that fight if you try to do that. Perhaps he's quoting uh, Proverbs 3.34 that has a great... Um, Encouragement about pride, if I can find it in my Bible here. Proverbs 3.24 says, that 3.34, 3.34, towards the scorners he's scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. So he's talking about the, on the good side that, that he exalts the humble, but to the proud, he opposes. Pride is a dangerous sin, isn't it? We're so good at recognizing pride in somebody else, but so bad at recognizing it in our own lives. It's so hard. Pride is a sneaky sin. You know, I'm so thankful, Greg, that I don't have a trouble with pride because I'm one of the most humble people I know. And uh, so, oh, wait, it just happened. It, see, it's just so sneaky like that. So uh, one of the... Um, Scriptures, Jonathan Edwards, the great uh, uh, writer of the past, of the uh, 
Puritans, uh, wrote an article and, and somebody pulled out some of his points about the sneaky nature of sin, uh, that uh, we sometimes can't see the symptoms of pride in our own lives. But he, he lists off seven things. Let me share those real quickly as if we need to know more about the pride in our lives because it does come. Pride often shows itself by fault finding. We're so good at looking at other people, and so we find their faults, and that can reveal some sin, some pride in our own hearts. A harsh spirit. A harsh spirit. Edward says, Christians who are but fellow worms ought to at least treat one another with as much humility and gentleness as Christ treats them. There's no other believer that you deserve to treat any other better, any different than the way Christ treats them. So beware of a harsh spirit. It may show some pride. Superficiality. I work on the outside, but on the inside there's wickedness. If we focus on what the appearance is, there may be some pride in secret. Defensiveness. I caught myself, uh, got, got an email, and I got a little defensive this week, and I thought of this article. I was like, oh, man, why do I feel like I, why do I bow up when I'm being challenged? I think it could be a little bit of pride in my life. Presumption before God. Um, some don't have any confidence. Some are, are presuming that they're good with God rather than being humble. We presume, look what all I've done. I'm on your A-list, God. I must be one of the best of your children ever. Well, that's pride. That's pride. Presuming God. Desperation for attention. If we want to be in the front, then Jesus can't be in the front. You know, if we want to be the one getting praised, then Jesus can't be the one getting praised. We have to be careful that when we get desperate for attention, that's when pride sneaks in. And then seventh, neglecting others. Because of pride, we'll often think of ourselves rather than others. Well, let me say, that's a bad day. That's a bad life to have the God of the universe oppose you. I don't want to be in that position, do you? To have God opposing you. He says, but he opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. How beautiful that is. The humble are given grace. Now, how do you and I develop humility? Well, that's a lifelong process. And a lot of times of discovering my pride and having it taken away and realize that I had no reason to be proud. But here in, in Romans 12, 3, if you want to write that verse down, Romans 12, 3 says, For by the grace given to me, I say to everyone among you that you should not think of himself more highly than he ought to think, but to think with sober judgment, each according to the measure of faith that God has assigned. Paul says, don't think more highly of yourself than you ought to. We can develop humility by remembering we're one of God's children. We're not his favorite child. We're one of his children. We should not think more highly of ourselves that we should. So who do you think you are is the question. Think humbly with God's grace. He'll do that. Now this phrase that, that sticks in my heart and has been making me think over and over again, this negative sermon about fights among ourselves, fights with God, enmity with God, being opposed by God. But then he gives this scripture, that, this phrase, he says, but he gives more grace. He gives more grace. Grace is that undeserved favor that God gives. And that's why we celebrate Him. That's why we sing with great joy this morning is because we've experienced His grace, those of us who know Him. Spurgeon, I just read, he had a whole sermon just on that one phrase. He gives more grace. He says, My spiritual poverty then is my own fault, for the Lord giveth more grace to all who believe for it. So he says, When I fall short, it's not me. Because God gives all the grace that we need. He gives more grace than we need. He says, my spiritual growth will be for his glory. For what? <clears throat> for I can only grow because he gives more grace. Oh, to grow constantly. So what I want us to think about this morning as we walk away is to think through this thought is that Jesus gives more grace. It's undeserved grace. It's abundant grace, grace that is greater than all our sin. His death on the cross was the ultimate sign of His grace. Jesus paid it all. All to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed it white as snow. 
That's grace that you and I have been received. More grace. More grace than we struggle with pride. There's more grace. He gives more. When we struggle with our covetousness, when we struggle with our selfish, selfish prayers, there's more grace. That's the gospel, that Jesus died on the cross, paid for our sins, was buried, and that he rose again, and he's going to return again. But he, he came so that you and I can experience more grace. We experience his grace. Here's the questions I have to leave with you in, this, in our time of wrapping things up. Is there a war raging within you? Pray. He gives more grace. Do you need to get right with somebody in this room or outside of this room? I would encourage you to respond in obedience to whatever God's leading you to do. Have you prompted a holy God to jealousy? Repent. He gives more grace. Are you suffering a losing battle because of your pride? Humble yourself because he gives more grace. Now, right now, we're going to sing a song, and I want to encourage you in this time that it would be a time of obedience, that you'd respond as God's Spirit has prompted your heart, that you do what he's led you to do. I want to pray and ask God to do that very thing. So maybe it's right there in your seat that you need to make uh, things right with God. Maybe you need to confess a covetous attitude. Maybe you need to confess anger, strife that you've been a part of. Maybe you need to make something right with somebody right here. And I would encourage you to step across the aisle or uh, grab somebody's hand if there's something that's happened that you need to say, I want to be right with you. But I want to encourage you to respond in obedience to whatever God leads you to do. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word that it speaks so practically. God, there's so many ways that this passage, even today, uh, has spoken to my life. And so, Lord, I pray that you'd help each one of us here in this room to respond in obedience during this time. Lord, that as we sing your praises, that we'll also think about our hearts, that if the word today has spoken to us, that if your spirit has prompted us with that jealous spirit of drawing us closer to you, reminding us of your covenant love. Lord, Lord, help us to respond in obedience. So we thank you again for this time, and we pray now that we'll do business with you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.